Thank you very much, Lorenzo. And uh, thank you also very much for the uh, first intervention, uh, which uh, makes us, I think, uh, hungry for more. Um, there will be uh, uh, plenty of uh, things to learn today, I, I assume, uh, all, for all of us, basically because it's a very new development. I will give you a little background information on how this um, BBNJ agreement came into play and I uh, do apologize already when I will also draw a larger picture uh, in order to let all um, uh, of our audience today uh, appreciate uh, the information they will get in order to uh, uh, allow a better understanding of the overall structure of uh, uh, international law of the sea, UNCLOS, and also the, um, um, you could say, the framework in which uh, uh, international law of the sea exists um, in international law. Well, I would like to give you a first, uh, um, uh, first some, some facts about uh, the uh, BBNJ agreement. Uh, as I've uh, already mentioned in my uh, uh, welcome uh, words, uh, it is about the agreement under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. And uh, uh, even though it is an agreement under UNCLOS, uh, we still have a, a, a rather large agreement, I have to uh, uh, admit, uh, with uh, 76 articles and uh, covering quite a wide range of, of topics. Uh, and we are uh, trying to cover as much as uh, possible today in order to give you first-hand information uh, what uh, to expect from the BBNJ agreement. It was uh, adopted on the 19th of June 2023, so a very recent um, uh, development, as I have already said, and it, is, it will be open for signature from uh, 20th of September 2023. So what we have to consider for the time being, for all of you who are not too familiar with international law, that this is uh, uh, an agreement which is not in force yet. So we are still uh, uh, in the process of waiting for the signatures to come and the ratification processes within the member states, um, uh, then coming to a threshold uh, that the BBNJ agreement um, uh, will enter into force. And uh, well, I may remind you uh, when we are looking into uh, uh, UNCLOS as uh, the overall framework, you could say, also for the BBNJ agreement, but all, also for basi basically all other activities in the uh, uh, law of the sea uh, domain, meaning all activities uh, in the seas and oceans. Um, uh, it took quite a while uh, until uh, the Constitution for the Oceans uh, entered into force. So uh, to remind you or to recall, uh, it was adopted in 1982 and uh, it took 12 years actually uh, until 1994 that UNCLOS could enter into force. But nowadays um, we have uh, 168 ratifications so we can, um, I think, with a, with a um, well, a clear, clear understanding, speak of a very uh, successful and important convention in international law. A little sketch uh, with regard to uh, the historical involvement of UNCLOS. Um, please. Uh, um, uh, allow me to, to skip, to go much more into detail, but just for, for those of you who are uh, interested to have a, a little uh, reminder of how UNCLOS uh, came into existence. Well, we do have an UNCLOS framework already, and uh, we uh, um, have, in the context of the entering into force of UNCLOS, 
the agreement relating to the implementation of part 11 with regard to the area of Arcos, the so-called implementation agreement we have in 1995, the agreement for the implementation of the provisions of UNCLOS relating to the conservation and management of straddling fish stocks and highly migratory fish stocks, the fish stocks agreement, and you could uh, um, see the BBNJ agreement from 2023 uh, in, this, in this context or the, within the UNCLOS framework, uh, also with regard to the interpretation of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the BBNJ agreement, but you will also see that there are some new definitions which will also help to understand and uh, interpret uh, UNCLOS. So it is a, a very valuable tool from my point of view, also with regard to the practical use and understanding, and perhaps also the uh, uh, further development, particularly when it comes to uh, um, uh, uh, judgments uh, with regard to UNCLOS. Um, well, I'm not going to uh, uh, explain too much about UNCLOS uh, because our topic today is the BBNJ agreement, but I would like to uh, um, recall at this moment also Article 192, which is from my point of view as the general obligation uh, of Part 12 on the protection and preservation of the marine environment the um, uh, central article with regard uh, to the uh, um, well initiative uh, leading towards the BBNJ agreement, and uh, which reads, states have the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. In this context, I may still also uh, recall 193, because we always have to uh, see this balancing fun function of UNCLOS, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, the uh, uh, protection on one hand, uh, on the one hand, and the uh, sustainable use on the other hand. You have uh, Article 193 of UNCLOS, which reads, states have the sovereign right to exploit their natural resources pursuant to their environmental policies and in accordance with their duty to protect and preserve the marine environment. And as I've said, this is a, a balancing function of UNCLOS, uh, which we will also see in the context of the BBNJ agreement. I would like to um, stress Article 2 of the BBNJ agreement on the general objective of, uh, of the agreement which reads, the objective of this agreement is to ensure the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction for the present and in long term through effective implementation of the relevant provisions of the convention and further international cooperation and coordination. So just to give you the main idea of the BBNJ agreement, uh, which always plays an important role. But as I've already mentioned, what I'm going uh, to give you before we enter into the uh, presentations uh, more in substance, I would like to give you the, um, well, the framework and the understanding of how the BBNJ agreement came into existence. And I would like to mention at first uh, the uh, uh, first uh, phase, you could say, uh, 2003 to two, 2004, the United Nations open-ended informal consultative process on oceans and the law of the sea, in Nicolas 4 and 5, uh, as, uh, well, you could say, the very uh, birth of the idea of uh, taking this up as, a, as an issue uh, in uh, uh, international fora. Um, I was, during uh, the period of 2003 to 2005, uh, uh, myself part of the German delegation to Unique Polos, and uh, I appreciated uh, the discussions at that time very much. And uh, I was uh, happy to see that uh, uh, in 2005, uh, in ad hoc, open-ended informal working group to study issues relating to the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity beyond areas, uh, uh, sorry, areas of national jurisdiction uh, was uh, established. 
which uh, took quite a while, as you can see, um, until a preparatory committee was actually put in place um, uh, in order to develop a, a so-called internationally legally binding instrument, which is, of course, uh, as we know today, the BBNJ agreement. In 2017, uh, uh, the decision was taken to convene an intergovernmental uh, conference, and this uh, conference uh, um, uh, took place between 2018 and 2023. And uh, uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, we are very happy that we have uh, speakers here who um, have uh, uh, taken part uh, in, uh, um, in, well, some of them in all five substantive sessions uh, or at least in, in parts of the sessions. So we will uh, get first-hand information on how uh, the uh, uh, discussions and uh, negotiations during the intergovernmental conferences uh, uh, took place and then leading to the adoption of the BBNJ agreement in 2023. But of course, um, international law is a much broader, more, uh, uh, um, you could say, uh, um, a field of law which goes beyond uh, international law of the sea. And this is also why I've, uh, 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 or why I'm trying to draw a broader picture. Um, and as I've uh, already apologized, uh, that may lead a little away from our today's subject, but I'm sure that you will appreciate that uh, at a later moment when you uh, see the overall, um, you could say, interlinkage between what I'm going to say right now and uh, what was uh, the outcome, you could say, of the BBNJ negotiations. And from our today's perspective, um, uh, we are speaking about in international law or in the UN context of the uh, uh, triple planetary crisis, uh, including uh, climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. And we do have um, a different, um, uh, you could say, milestones. Uh, which have uh, uh, led to this understanding and uh, um, while well, making us aware of uh, those international challenges we are facing today. And uh, well, first, uh, um, I would like to mention 1972, the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment uh, in uh, Stockholm, which um, is considered to be uh, the birth of uh, uh, international environmental law and also um, a first step towards uh, uh, understanding the importance of uh, the protection of uh, the marine environment as well. With uh, 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 different and further steps like the uh, uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, with its uh, Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement, um, the uh, UNFCCC from 1992, um, and also uh, 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 the uh, 1993 United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, we are speaking in a uh, well context of the awareness, you could say, of the international community, uh, which uh, um, which was um, well somehow. Uh, um, discussed at the Rio conference and is uh, the next important milestone, you could say, uh, on this long line of understanding the importance uh, with regard to the protection of, uh, of uh, the marine environment. We do have in 2004 an ad hoc open-ended working group on protected areas. We will hear about that more in detail uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a short while. And uh, uh, last but not least, in 2022, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, which is uh, somehow the uh, um, um, parallel uh, development in international law with regard uh, to the protection of biodiversity. 
um, we will see that there are a lot of strings, you could say, um, on the um, uh, uh, in the international on the international scene with regard uh, to uh, um, uh, this this very very topic uh, in different fora. Um, uh, obviously, from our background and uh, the uh, um, focus of the. Uh, uh, of the ULO Summer School, we are uh, f focusing a lot on uh, uh, on uh, UNCLOS, and obviously the BBNJ is uh, in the framework of UNCLOS. But we will uh, look today also in in other uh, areas um, uh, with regard to uh, MPAs, with regard to. Um, um, uh, genetic resources. Uh, we will also see other fora uh, which do have uh, um, parallel developments in international law. In this context, I also would like to draw your attention to the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, and uh, the uh, understanding, you could say, of uh, um, the protection of the oceans uh, in uh, three, uh, uh, or in, uh, with regard to the three dimensions of sustainable development uh, as it is understood today, so including environmental, economic, and social aspects. And uh, um, I would like to refer here uh, uh, to the uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development which includes 17 sustainable development goals. And I've uh, uh, just put uh, uh, some of them here as uh, representing the uh, particular focus uh, of the BBNJ agreement uh, uh, without uh, uh, limiting it to those four. We have discussed that BBNJ agreement is about um, uh, uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction. And for those of you who are, well, not uh, um, uh, directly aware what that means, I would like to recall that we are speaking about uh, the marine uh, uh, zones, the high, high seas, and the so-called the area. Um, which we also find as a definition in Article 1, Number 2 of the BBNJ Agreement. And uh, uh, I give you a little sketch here as well uh, to show you the uh, uh, different zones uh, for those of you who have, uh, haven't got that for in front of its mental or mental picture uh, just to uh, uh, allow a better understanding. Uh, we will look into uh, those uh, uh, areas just in a few few minutes uh, with regard to uh, the rights and duties there as well. But at first I would like to mention Article 7 of the BBNJ agreement which reads, in order to achieve the objectives of this agreement, parties shall be guided by the following principles and, and approaches. We will hear uh, some more of them during the presentations, but from uh, for, for my uh, part here, I would like to mention just two of them, uh, which is the principle of the common heritage of humankind, which is set out in the convention, and the freedom of marine scientific research together with other freedoms of the high seas. Um, when it comes to the common heritage of humankind, um, I've uh, um, uh, um, well uh, taken up Article 136 of UNCLOS, which reads, the, the area and its resources are the common heritage of mankind. Um, and uh, 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 the definitions of UNCLOS, and we do see that this is one of the reasons why we had uh, to rethink uh, well, many of the aspects which are included now in the BBNJ agreement, since uh, the uh, 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 since the uh, uh, since UNCLOS is dealing with um, uh, uh, well the resources you could say, uh, meaning in this context all solid, liquid, and gaseous mineral resources in situ in the area, uh, meaning that uh, uh, there is a, a gap you could say 
uh, with the noun clause which had to be filled. With regard to the high seas, uh, we are speaking of all parts of the sea which are not included in the EEZ, the exclusive economic zone, the territorial sea, or in the internal waters of a state, or in the agipelagic states, uh, uh, sorry, agipelagic waters of an agipelagic state. And uh, it is open to all states, whether coastal or landlocked. So this is basically the guiding uh, um, uh, hand, you could say, with regard to uh, where it uh, uh, takes place within the high seas and the area. So na no state may validly purport to subject any part of the high seas to its sovereignty uh, to recall uh, why it is called beyond national jurisdiction here in this uh, context. I would also like to mention Article uh, 87, subsection 1 of UNCLOS, uh, which reads, the high seas are open to all states, whether coastal or landlocked. Freedoms of the high seas um, is exercised under the conditions laid down by this convention and by other rules of international law. It comprises inter alia both for coastal and landlocked states. The freedoms of navigation as uh, the classical freedom uh, within uh, the high seas, but in our context uh, under um, letter F, we do have the freedom of scientific research, which was newly implemented um, uh, uh, by Iron Clause, uh, and it's entering into force in 1994. So uh, we come uh, slowly to an end of my uh, uh, introductory presentation, you could say, and uh, I would like to uh, recall uh, the uh, four um, parts, you could say, of the BB&J agreement, which are represented today uh, through the different um, presentations. We do have part two on the marine genetic resources, including the fair and equitable sharing of benefits, Part three, measures such as area-based management tools, including marine protected areas. Part four, environmental impact assessments. And part five, on the capacity building and the transfer of marine technologies. Uh, sorry, technology. Um, basically, uh, I would, uh, uh, towards the end, um, invite you to uh, um, watch uh, our series of videos on the law of the sea if you'd like. Um, they were produced in the context of uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, scientific year on seas and oceans uh, in 2016-17, uh, just as a, a little um, uh, nice uh, view on the law of the sea. And I've uh, uh, some uh, uh, smaller links uh, for further information if you want to uh, read any, anything more in detail. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, I would like to uh, um, uh, ask Lorenzo to uh, uh, continue with the introductory part and thank you very much. Uh, see you later.